So today we are going to talk about universal design um, and learning, but I, I don't know how much you guys have talked about universal design in the past very much. Okay, good. So we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're going to talk, then we'll touch on universal design on universal design for learning. I prepared a slide deck. I have no problem, problem at all going off deck. So if we get into something we're like, oh my gosh, we need to sit and marinate and talk about this for the rest of the time, totally fine with that. Um, I, I am not a super duper fluid expert, but I'm familiar with a lot of what's going on here. And what I wanna give you, my goal today is to give you three different platforms you can use and give you some background information on universal design and universal design for learning, okay? Uh, and so this is me, uh, Dr. Scott Hazel. Okay, who, who just walked in, what's your name? Okay, I have a thing here just, just for you advertisement here. If you Hello. Good to see you again. Likewise. You Please. Cosmopolitan. Uh, no, tonight I'll have, have a Stella Art. Us that, we, that I forgot to turn on right off the bat. I keep I kept saving it. Is um, one little thing right here called the, the closed captioning. We'll do some subtitles. Who watches subtitles when they watch movies? Who's hard of hearing? That's a universal design feature. It benefits everybody. We don't watch anything in my house anymore without subtitles on because the missus wants to know what everybody is saying. So let me see if I can get back here to the beginning without going backwards. Oh, I knew it. Hello. Gosh, Good to see you free. again. Likewise. Please, Cosmopolitan. Nope. Tonight I'll have a Stella Artois. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wild night, huh? Why, Russian? No, Gary, give me a Stella Art Toes. <laughs> Excuse me. Good choice. Well, changing can do a little good. <laughs> do the vibes. <laughs> so these are two classic characters from pop culture. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker as um, <laughs> reprising her role as Carrie from uh, Sex and the City, and she she always got Cosmos, right? Like every time she went out, she got a Cosmo, she got a Cosmo, she got a Cosmo. And the dude from Big Lebowski who always had a Russian, a white Russian. Careful, watch out for the Russian, man. Um, but so this demonstrates to them, you, you know, sort of the basis for everything today. It's just, it's a small change. They're s still enjoying things that they've enjoyed in the past in the social atmosphere. And, and so that's sort of what we're gonna look at today is just we're gonna make a couple small changes in how our course content is delivered and designed for our students so that we can reach as broad an audience as possible, not just one specific person in that audience. Okay, that's where we're headed. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at what universal design is, just kind of examine that to set, to set us in a frame of what universal design for learning might look like. There's seven principles for universal design. There's three principles for universal design and learning. I'm gonna offer, give you three tech tools to consider to help, uh, something that you can include starting tomorrow with your classes. And then we're gonna talk about universal design for learning in D2L. There's a lot of things in there uh, that you can utilize as well. We could actually, this whole workshop could have just been on what happens in, in D2L. But I thought, ah. We'll get bored. Okay, I'll use the, I think I can use the thing. So why do we want to use UDL? Why do we want to consider it? A lot of what occurs in UDL is rooted in uh, theory, educational theory, zone of proximal development, um, scaffolding, Bloom's taxonomy, modeling, mentors, all of these different things have, have helped lead to the development and growth of UDL. And there has been a ton of scientific research that's gone into this, looking at how the brain learns and, and it supports the design that UDL offers. And then there's three, three principles uh, that come into this and they impact different parts of the brain. And ultimately, if we're trying to help our students learn, then we need to try and use everything that's available to us in our toolkit. UDL offers a framework that can help your student learn um, as, as best as we can help them learn, okay? So that's what we're gonna look at today. 
and here's what we're gonna here's the specifics then we're gonna look at a thing called Plickers. So that's that's this guy. Plickers is a free platform available to you. You use your your mobile device, and I'll show you how it works in just a second. Uh, we'll look at the UD, what Universal Design is, the, a quick discussion of Universal Design, principles of, of UDL. We'll look at Sway, which is something else that you can consider using with your courses. We have access to Sway through Microsoft Office. It's a Microsoft Office product, uh, so we'll have that. We'll look at the questions that you can consider as you look at the three different principles of Universal Design for Learning. We'll have a discussion of how you can just make small changes and alter some of your current lesson plans. We'll look at Flipgrid, which is also in the Microsoft family and is free to us. And then we'll look at UDL and D2L. Are there, are there any huge questions before we get going? This is a safe place to ask questions if you have them or want to know. If I can't answer them, Paul can. <laughs> <laughs> so, Plickers. Uh, what are Plickers? Plickers are these little weird little QR codes. Okay, each student gets one. You can do, I think, 40 at a time. So if you have a class of more than 40, there may be a small fee. So if you sort of like what this is, how this is set up, then you can do that. Um, it's, so it's great here. I think most of our classes here are small-ish, you know, for all intents and purposes. I know there are some larger courses. There's low physical impact. The students don't need anything ex except this one sheet of paper, and all they have to do is be able to hold it up in some fashion. So even students that maybe are limited through their mobility can at least, if, if they can hold the sheet of paper and get it in front of them in a specific direction, then it's easy for them to use. It's simple and intuitive. Uh, if you'll look at these, they have an A, B, C, and D around the edges. And so the answer that you want to choose is the, is the letter that you put on the top of the page. So as you turn the page around, you can choose between four different options. The option you like is at the top. And there's a tol there's tolerance for error. So if I flash C and the teacher scans and I'm like, oh, 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 no, 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 B, then the teacher can rescan it and it's okay. So it's not a problem at all. You want to see how this works? It's really fun. So we're going to hop out of this guy and hop over here to Plickers. Plickers right here. And I have Plickers on my phone. So I'm going to open the app and I'm going to choose a question and we're going to add it to the queue. So here comes the question. When it comes to universally designed lessons, I have no idea. I can help someone else. I can do this but need some help or I can do this but I'm not able to help any others. So you, you hold up what you feel is your best response to that. And I have the Plickers app on my phone, so it uses the camera, and then I just, I can scan, like I can get Jenny from here, and Diana, I got you. Yeah. And so I can scan everybody as they, as they go through. If you wanna move around, and you can see up here too that it flashes their names. Um, I can also on here, it can tell me if it's a, a right or wrong answer it can flash up green for that person got it correct or red for they didn't. So if you've got some guiding questions that we have to understand before diving into today's lesson, nobody knows if they've got it right or wrong, but you do because you're looking at it. And up here, all they see is that their name has been used. But you're like, oh my gosh, red, red, red. Whew, we're gonna have to start. We're gonna have to start this at, at ground zero today because they did not learn the material. The other thing that you can do is you can show the gra a graph of what students chose as well because sometimes we just need to talk about where where are we so I can do this but I need some help okay I have no idea and this is a very safe way for students to go you know what I don't know because if you were to go in and ask a class of students hey who knows this or not they're gonna start looking around they're either not gonna answer at all or they're gonna say they do because they don't want to appear that they don't and just like that that question was answered so here comes the next one there is no difference between universal design and a universal design lesson. True or false? True or false. And, and Jenny, you get to answer again. We used yours yesterday when we were typing. Yeah. And, and again, I can, just, I can just check from right here. So that's how, that's, how quickly, that's how quickly I can scan my class. 
Who wants to do the Who wants to do the next one? Is anybody, would anybody like to do the next question? Nobody wants to do the next question. <laughs> <laughs> so again, and again, we can look at the. Um, we can show the graph. True or false? There is no, there is no difference. Well, I don't know. We'll find out hopefully by the end of the of today. Next question. Universal design is guided by how many principles? Universal design is guided by how many principles? I did. I did. I said it. <laughs> I said both of them already. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> so let's see what the class thought here. All right. <laughs> so we'll <laughs> we'll look at the end of class maybe and see if we learned. <laughs> so and then lastly, universal design is fake news uh, based on. <laughs> I like these two together because they're so polar opposite to our current environment. <laughs> um, are specifically designed for accessibility and make lessons all touchy feely. Uh, so Ashley's going to pick D probably because. <laughs> uh, let's see. So there you go. Just just that quickly, uh, you can get your your students' feedback. Um, so yeah. Can you show in real time who got it correct? Uh, yeah, but I didn't have it turned on for that. But I think it, um, if you want them to see who got it correct, it'll flash red or green here. All the data that, by the way. So if you were in my class and we were doing this, this is data then that goes into my Flickr's account, so I can download it. So. I'm not so concerned that they know who got it right or wrong. I want to know for later, and you'll have access to that. So, good question. Um, so there you go. There's there's all there's these two things. Nobody picked fake news. I don't know if I'm disappointed or not. So that's Flickr's. Really easy to do. So if you've already got those questions that are true or false or four choices, uh, I think you know then you can just type them in and, and get off and going. You just have to upload your class. Yeah, I love Kahoot. Is it, what, would, what would be the benefit of, of one or the other? Um, the so with Kahoot, if you're talking about accessibility, the students have to have a device. Right. That's the biggest difference. With this one, as the instructor, you would print out your yeah. cards and give them to the students. Okay. Uh, I like Kahoot a lot, um, but and the, the other drawback to Kahoot, too, is it's, the, it's timed. So it's like bar trivia. And, and once you make your choice on Kahoot, there's no, oh, I hit the wrong button, because sometimes the kids will hover over. So I love Kahoot if it's very formative assessment. Like, I don't care if the kids are getting it right or wrong right off the bat. Um, I want them to feel a little bit of stress from the timer and the bar trivia style. Um, and most kids have phones, so it's usually not a big deal. But I, I do like Kahoot. And there's another one. If you if you uh, like Kahoot, there's another one called Quiz Is, and I like Quiz Is and Kahoot. They're identical except with Kahoot, the teacher guides the questions. Just like I did this right here, I put the question up, everybody answered the question. On Kahoot, the question comes up for 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes, and you answer it, and then it goes to the next question. With Quiz Is, what comes up is different for each student. So you guys could all go through the quiz is as the instructor, I would open it. And as the, t as the student, you would answer your questions when they became available. So you could all move through it at your own rate. And so for that reason, I like quizzes a little bit better because it allows the students a little bit more time um, to work sort of at their own pace. Also yeah, now Quizlet, yeah. So, and I'll, I will send a follow-up email. Let me just make a note um, with links to Kahoot, Quizzes, and Quizlet. Those are all free apps, and they're easy to use, and they're fun. Like, I had high school calculus kids that I didn't think, like, Kahoot. This is like, you know, we're talking third grade sort of stuff. High school calculus kids. I, I figured out how to put a calculus question on there, and I would put the timer up, and when the timer ended, everybody made some sort of noise whether it was celebratory or disgust 
And it was so fun that I sat at the back of the room. I just started videoing them because it was hilarious. They'd be like, oh, yeah, ah, and it was all 25 kids every time. Um, okay, so Kahoot quizzes, and what was the other one? Quizlet. Quizlet. Those are all excellent tools. Okay, so back to let's, let's dig into universal design, and I'll use this clicker. So, bang. All right, universal design. There's seven different things that go into universal design, all right? <laughs> That's right, <laughs> Aaron's like, yeah. Equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive to use, perceptible information, tolerance for error, low physical effort, size and space are appropriate for the use. So those are the seven guiding principles to universal design. Okay, I'm getting back to you, okay. so. A specific definition then from the Center for Excellence in Universal Design is this. Universal design is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. What we're saying is we want as many people as possible to be able to use this thing. Now, if you have a physical impairment, and we need to make a modification. That does not fall under universal design, okay? And, and that falls under some different rules because we do want to be as accessible as possible. But also some of us need more accessibility than what would be, fall under a more broader spectrum. Does, does that make sense? And then we try and meet those needs where possible. And so in education, especially in the K-12 world, that's where you're looking at like individual uh, educational planes and things like that where we're specifically modifying a test for a student or maybe here if we're working with a student that who um, whose native language is not English where we're like okay the student needs a couple hours on this test instead of the normal 50 minutes that's a specific accommodation that we're making for a specific student so universal design and use universal design for learning is is a little bit different than that okay so here they are again I want you to look at these and I want you to think now <coughs> and have a minute to talk with your shoulder neighbor. Where have you seen on campus examples of universal design? So think for a few minutes. Talk with those people sitting next to you. Uh, okay. Uh, bring you guys all back together. In our workshop hub, CETL workshop hub, I have a, a discussion board. So. I don't know if everybody's in there yet, but you will be. Please contribute. You know, what are some of those universal design um, elements that you've seen on campus? So who would like to share out s what they have seen? Crash bars on doors. There's two, there's two visible in this room, believe it or not. Open tables versus mm -hmm. desks. Mm -hmm. Because all you got to be able to do is get to it in whatever fashion yeah and the door handles so the door handles you just need to be able to push down on it instead of actually grip the handle and twist so there's there's a lot of different things in here and and in our the newer buildings as buildings get renovated a lot of the doors are wider now to accommodate people um, that that need more space to pass through so a lot of that is just universal design but it's things that have benefited all of us the closed captioning on the YouTube video that that is part of universal design now uh, it was originally created to help those that were hard of hearing. Um, we're not hard of hearing in the Hazelwood household. I mean, the, some people think there's hard of hearing going on, but but we all use closed captions. So when you get a chance and you get into D2L, I would love for you to submit your ideas of what you've seen about universal design onto the discussion board. It'll just help us consider more broadly how it can impact our courses. All right. Now, we're going to talk about universal design for learning, and there's three different principles that guide universal design for learning. And I chose this as an image to represent that because a lot of times as teachers, we have a very methodical way that we deliver our instruction. You know, Roman numeral one, capital letters, subset A, subset, you know, Arabic num numeral one, subset lowercase a, su you know, subset little Roman numeral, you know, like this is the structure shall not deviate. 
So this is called a sketch note. Has anybody ever done anything with sketch notes before? Ashley? Okay. No? No? Okay. That's, this is the same thing for the person that made this. This is the way they organized a discussion based on universal design. It's a way that makes meaning for that person. As a faculty person, as an, as an instructor, we really we want our students to learn. But we learn differently than the person on our left, and we learn differently than the person on our right. And we're going to learn a little bit differently than our students. So if our students can get the same material and make meaning of that in a way that's important to them, that allows them to firmly, more strongly seat that information in their brains, then that's what we want ultimately. We want them to learn the material we're trying to teach. A sketch note allows students to do that. It's not the only way. Uh, I myself, when I take notes, I'm just a, I'm like a bullet jotter. Is anybody else like, oh, he said something I need to, I, bullet, write it out. Hardly any organization at all, which is terrible, but it works for me. Some of our students are very creative. This, this works for them. So this is stepping into a universal design for learning. It's lowering those barriers a little bit. It doesn't have to be so rigid how the notes come out from you. So let's examine. The things that we're looking at with universal design for learning are we want to allow multiple means of engagement for students. We want to allow multiple means of representation for their work. And we want to allow multiple means of action and expression. And a lot of what you're going to see today comes from CAST and from a, a book. And we've got a copy over here in our library, um, Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone, Universal Design for Learning in Higher Ed. And uh, it's written by Thomas Tobin and Kirsten Bailing, and it's really good. I grabbed another one out of our library, Planning and Teaching for Universal Design. And so this is, when I give it back to circulation, it'll be upstairs, I think, on fourth floor. I don't remember. Somewhere in this building. Not on, not on this floor. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it really is fascinating to, to read. Um, and so anyway, so this came from the, from the cast folks, you know, the why of learning, the what of learning, and the how of learning. So, so things to just consider. As, as you're working with your students, how can you r share your information in a way that's different for them, that's multiple means of representation? So, for example, I'm gonna sh I've shared with you the PowerPoint already. I emailed it to you this morning. So if you had a chance to look at it, you could have. If you want to look at it later, you can. It's not going to hurt my feelings if you look at it. I'm not going to hide it from you because I want you to learn it and be able to refer to it later. And I'm going to show you a slide here in a minute of, in, of the uh, engagement, representation, and action and expression. But now you also have something in your hand. So there's two ways right there that I've given you an opportunity to have this information. <clears throat> so real briefly, an overview of UDL. <clears throat> Universal design for learning is based on the premise that traditional curriculum is difficult. Ah, oh, it's terrible. Okay. <laughs> Horrible design, right? So compare this information to something like this. We got a picture and we have words. So some of you read the words first, some of you looked at the pictures first. So compare these two. Which is easier for your eyes? Right? So think about your students. What's going to be easier on their eyes? I know, yeah, it's important. That's why you're in class and I'm telling you this. But it doesn't need to all go in one slide, right? And look, so look back through the other slides that we've got going. There's text, there's pictures. Right? So think about that for your students. I had a one of my um, faculty members who I love, Dr. Bindenwald. I love him dearly. But he was one of these kind of PowerPoint slide guys. I'm like, oh my gosh, Dr. Bindenwald, for real. Like, I cannot keep up. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's look at Sway. Sway is another way that your students can submit something to you. So if you tell your students, hey, I really like for you to do this thing, and it needs to be in PowerPoint, okay? Let Sway be an option to be different from PowerPoint, okay? So when we talk about one of those three principles, this is an alternative way for them to submit your work. You're still examining what they show you. They're still having to do it in a way that makes sense and has flow uh, and, 
and demonstrates to you that they learned what you need them to learn, but it is different and it's a little fun and it, it looks like this. This is in our office package. Once you log in online, you can have access to it. It's just called Sway. And I think when I went to this again, I had to log in again. I don't know why. It's listed there as one of the tiles I can choose from when I first log into Office, and then I click, and it's like, use your organization's sign-in. So universal design for learning, and then I can just scroll down. There's another sketch note. What are the three principles? I can make stuff bold. I can have some things. Picture with a caption. And you can use this in a lot of different ways. You can have your students blog about what's going on in their class. You, you know, one of the best things for students to help them learn, hey, reflect on what we talked about this week and make a sway for it. Take you 30 minutes, do it over the weekend, won't hurt you. At some point in time, you're going to be sitting around bored because nothing happens for a college kid, right? They just sit around bored all the time. Make a sway and, tell, you know, and, sh and share with us what did you learn this week. What, qu what are three things you learned, two questions you have, one action you'll take based on class this week? So a simple blog. They can post it into D2L. They can give feedback to each other from that. They can put together presentations. So if you have them where they've got to present work, they can build Sway for that. You can use Sway to create a newsletter for your students. Hey, here's what's coming up this week. And it's fun looking. And it's a web link. And you can post that web link into, D, into D2L, and your students can access it from any time on any device. How would I post that, Scott? Well, How do I get to that? Dr. Gad, that's an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. So right up here is a share button. And in that share button, you get a link to your Sway. And so as soon as you've published your Sway, uh, you can share it with your students. Scrolling, I'm not really seeing how is it really different from uh, PowerPoint. It it isn't. It's a presentation platform. The difference the difference being that uh, sometimes when kids look at PowerPoint, there's all the things to do because there's the whole banner at the top, and Sway doesn't have quite as many choices. So it's just kind of a, a web, web link. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way for them to interact. It, but a, a lot of it is the same. They can still put a picture in. They still are required to put in text. So there are still some of those limitations. But it gives them some choice uh, that could work for you. So instead of saying everybody has to do a PowerPoint, you could say choose PowerPoint or Sway. And all of a sudden they're like, yes, I have a choice. And that can help. It's a good question. Uh, let's see, stories, newsletters. You can do this at the beginning of the semester. So I'm teaching an online class this semester, and I wanted to get to know the students. Like, who are you? Have them do a sway. Have five fun questions. What's your favorite dessert? What was your first car? You know, and do you like cats or dogs? And we all know there's only one answer. Dogs. Yeah, it could be, or just just whatever. You can give them a prompt. They can upload video. They can upload a picture. They can put text to it. Is there any format required in terms of the how they upload their videos? Mm -mm. And I showed you mine scrolled top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Some of them scroll left to right, so they could choose sort of how that goes as well. Another way to look at UDL is to think about how we want our students to, to learn and the access that we're giving them. So in this picture, you have, a, you have this really tall kid, and he's on the block, and he can see over everything. you got a somewhat shorter kiddo, and he's on the block, and he can barely see over. And what you can't see is there's like two little eye holes that this little kid's looking through. So they can all see the ball game, right? Like you saw the ball game, kid. I don't know why you're complaining. We could do something like this where we take, again, take those same three blocks and we sort of redistribute them so now everybody can see over the fence, okay? Or we can just get rid of the things that are in the way, which can sometimes be hard for us as teachers because we're creatures of habit and we like have done these things forever and we know they're good. But so how can we be, how can we take what we're brilliant at and what we're great at and offer a little bit of flexibility in there? 
So first principle, multiple means of engagement. Multiple means of engagement. So these are the guiding questions to think of as you're considering how to have your students engage with you in the class. How can you incorporate variety? Oh, that's a terrible slide, isn't it? Hard to read. How can you incorporate student interaction or collaboration? Yeah. How could you use technology? What opportunities exist for student choice? How can you encourage self-regulation? I didn't give you either one of these, did I? <laughs> sorry. So, I'm so sorry, Dr. Gibb. <laughs> we'll talk later, I know. Uh, so these are sort of your guiding questions for this multiple means of engagement. And I think if, if we go through and we examine how our teaching practice currently looks, we go, we can make a couple, we can do a couple things a little differently without creating a lot of extra stress for us, right? PowerPoint or Sway, they're going to do the same thing. Here's a PowerPoint a week ahead of time. Here's a handout to go with it. So, you know, some small tweaks here and there. Question two, or principle number two, multiple means of representation. So. Here's one, here's one way to represent information. So here's another. So organize just a little differently. How can you ensure your course materials are accessible to as many students as possible? With the, with, with the understanding that we're not trying to make a modification for a specific learning need, but we're trying to capture as many kids as possible with this particular information. How might you present main course concepts in more than one format? Does your course offer opportunities to engage student agency? What learning activities could emphasize comprehension, comprehension of key concepts? And one of the things I saw in some of the reading I did, um, one of the ideas here was, the, the suggestion was, you, you know what you're going to ask them on the exam. So give them some exam questions during your lecture. Uh, and he was sort of blunt about it. Like, we're not trying to hide what we're testing them on. We want them to know these things. Uh, how might you informally gauge student understanding of course concepts? And that, that was where you could use Plickers or Kahoot or Quizzes or Quizlet. And the third principle is multiple means of action and expression. So notice I went back to sort of a similar view, but still a little different, right? So how might you incorporate multiple means of expression on exams? Some things there's only one way to assess. Like I have to see this thing. But sometimes there's multiple ways to assess. Um, for, for example, if, if I'm not in a course where I have to assess the specific writing of a student, but I ask them to submit a paper, could they submit a video of themselves explaining to you what it is that they've been asked a question on? Could that meet, could that, meet that need? And I would argue, yes, as long as it's not something where I need to grade your grammar and make sure that you have a good command of, of the English language and the sentence structure and things like that. Um, is it a multiple choice test? Yeah, okay, a little hard to do that one through video, right? But are there other ways that they could do that? So what other opportunities exist to incorporate multiple means of expression for assignments? Uh, how might you provide feedback opportunities? And I know that one of the things D2L provides is they provide you the opportunity to share audio or video feedback with your students on that paper. So here's something to consider. A lot of our students are going to engage D2L through their mobile device because they're going to look at, they, they may look at it walking across campus, they may be looking at it sitting on the couch in their dorm room or wherever. If you give them audio feedback, they don't have to try and read on their device what the feedback is. It takes about the same amount of time. If you can give them audio feedback, they can play it and they can listen. They can listen while they're in the car driving. They can listen to audio feedback for an assignment. They c I guess they could read their feedback while they're driving. But I don't know, <laughs> like that one time, I don't want to talk about it, but I was reading while driving. Um, so what choices might you offer students re regarding assignments, communication, and content delivery? Uh, and what course design decisions can you make to mitigate student anxiety regarding assessment? And that was, a, that was another area they talked about, but you know, nobody particularly enjoys taking tests, I think, in general. I mean, I don't. Some of you may thrive on that. Um, and I know there's been tests in the past where I've studied my tail off and thought I had a good command of material only to take a test and feel like, oh my gosh, I'm lower than dirt because wow. And then get it graded and hand it back to me and, and yeah. Um, 
So how can we help alleviate some of that stress? So be upfront with your expectations with the students. Like, this is what you'll need to know for this thing, uh, which a lot of us uh, do. So three principles, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. All right, so you've got both here. So what I would like for you to do is talk with your folks around you. And after you, we've now just talked about a few things, okay? And we went through it super fast too, so I know we're not experts. But what have you heard that's jiggled something in your brain where you're like, you know what? I can maybe try this in class tomorrow and see if it works. Or what if I did this? What do you think? So talk amongst yourselves. Use these as sort of uh, physical reminders of our brief conversation. And then we have an activity. So ready, talk. One, two, three, talk. All right, so I want to make sure that I can talk about desire to learn also. So on your phone, open your web browser or on your iPad or tablet or computer. And I did have a shortened URL for this, and I was, I was just telling Ashley, when I checked my shortened URL this right before our workshop started, it went to a broken link. It's, it's <laughs> a rat second, son of a. Um, so padlet.com forward slash teaching from here forward slash CEDL UDL. Padlet.com forward slash teaching from here forward slash CEDL UDL. Looks like this, super friendly. Uh, again, the one in uh, potential hitch in the giddy up is the students would need a device. Most of our students have it, but even in situations of students don't, you can have them work in pairs because if you're just getting feedback or wanting them to participate, then everybody would still have an opportunity to submit. Um, I like Padlet because it's, it's really easy to use. You hit the plus on the screen or double click and then you put in your thoughts. Depending on how you want to organize this with your class, you could have your students put their name as the, head, as the, the title headline, or you could just have them leave it blank and put their thoughts into the box, and then it becomes a big sticky note board. They'll ask questions here that they wouldn't ask out loud. So this is another way that we can give students an opportunity to have some agency. And it's kind of fun. You can change the backgrounds around and put different things in there. Uh, a teacher of my friend of mine and I were teaching the same class at the same time in different classrooms. We were doing our classes completely different that year. So we had a Padlet up of questions and we both had the Padlet on while we were teaching. And so the kids were able to ask questions without having to raise their hand which meant that there were a lot of questions on here because it wasn't the one student dominating all the questions. You know, that one where you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even finish the sentence. Let your brain process first. So they can put those questions here. And it, it really went really well until some kid took a picture of his cheese balls and Mountain Dew. And then, <laughs> and then it went downhill a little bit, but we were able to hurry them back to where we needed them to be. But um, so yeah, so Padlet is something that's, that's really easy to use for your students. Again, you can put that link right into D2L so that you don't have to, you know, I had to give you the link earlier because we're not all in D2L yet. I think you're getting added today or at some point. And so you can put that link to into D2L and your students can access it from their phone or if you're, they bring their laptop or whatever, they can access it from that. Okay, I'm re really, really, really short on time. So I'm gonna zip through these next couple things real quick. So hang, hold on. What's that line in uh, Jurassic Park? Yeah, hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. Uh, so Flipgrid. I wanted to get to Flipgrid today. We're going to skip it. But you can give your students an opportunity to engage with each other through video on their phone or their laptop. Flipgrid is so fun. It's really fun. Uh, I think they've talked about it before I got here in Seattle, so it's not a brand new thing. It's in the Microsoft family, so it's no cost to educators or to us. 
super great. It's like video voicemail, and you can set them up to do different things. So uh, it's also more fun than a PowerPoint. So if you if you want your kids to give some sort of presentation, consider Flipgrid. Uh, in D2L, some things to, to consider as part of universal design. Number one, your students at some point are going to engage your course through their mobile device. Would you want to engage your course through a mobile device? Do you have this much stuff that you've got typed into that one module? Okay, where the kid's reading it and scrolling, 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 scrolling. Chunk it. Give it a part one, two, three. Let them scroll through that while they're walking across campus or something like that, or maybe walking down the hall. Maybe. We want to think the best about our students. Perhaps as soon as class is out, they're looking at what's coming next. And on their walk to their next course, they're scrolling through your notes. Okay, So chunk it so that it s scales correctly to their phones. You can copy and paste your Word documents. If you just upload your Word document, that's great. And if you have it go to that uh, file preview, that's great but hard to read on a phone. So upload your Word document syllabus, but copy your syllabus and paste it in its own content module. Give it its own content um, for the students to look at. Uh, utilize discussion boards even with face-to-face -face courses. Remember, some students are not going to engage with you at all during class. They just won't. My, my son is, uh, is, is one of those. He will not engage you during class. But he does have questions because he asks them when he gets home. And they're good questions. He would benefit if his, his, his school district uses uh, Google Classroom. If they had a discussion for some of those things, he would use that because he wouldn't have to share in class. He can't stand to talk in class. It embarrasses him to, to no end. But he'll play a bassoon in the orchestra. So give them that. There's a, a spot in D2L called the Accessibility Checker. Have you guys seen this? So utilize the Accessibility Checker. It's in your HTML editor. I'll show you where it is really quickly. Um, so let's go to Universal Design. So I put together a resources page, which has links to all the stuff. So if I were to edit this, edit the HTML, then down here at the bottom, under this eyeball, this is your accessibility checker and it will tell you if you've formatted things correctly. So when you're putting your information into the HTML box, use a headline because the screen reader will notice that and tell the student, hey, we've got a break in how the things are occurring. So utilize um, like a headline style and a paragraph style. The screen reader will catch all that and notify the student. And we've gone over time. <sighs> so everything is in here for you guys. Do you have any huge questions? I gave you some more resources here, more than that we talked about in class. Check them all out. They're all free. I only like free stuff because free. Uh, and here's some resources for you for UDL and D2L. And here's some resources for you that come from research. Questions, comments, or dirty words? Uh -huh. the different things to look at and yeah. places to kind of focus my attention. And I, but maybe it's just because I'm used to getting it one way and that's how I prefer it. But I, so do you ever, are you ever concerned that you're giving them too many things to kind of look at? I give them no more than three choices. Okay. Um, the first week that they're with me, it's always hard because they're like, I don't know which one to do. I'm like, your choice. Ha <laughs> ha. So, um, the first time I did it, I, I gave them like 10 or 15. And they were like, Hazelwood. Like, does not compute. I have no idea. But um, so over time, I figured out what worked for my personality was three choices. So if I have three choices available, that's what I give them. Yeah. And I try and be at least two. Sometimes, though, there's only, sometimes you're limited. There's only one way to do things. But I think um, my, my, my view on that is <laughs> a kid goes, I'm an auditory learner. And I go, I'm going to explain to you and intricate detail a map of Africa you tell me where Uganda is okay auditory is not going to work or the other one that I like to share with my students is when they go well I'm just visual okay watch me swing this golf club and then you're going to come over here and hit the golf ball too um, 
you know, so we have to be able to, yes, there's going to be strengths and weaknesses to everything, but at some point they're going to have to do. And, and that's where learning occurs, right, is, is in the do part, so. Oh yeah, sure can. And you have ac you'll have access to this in the D2L hub. Yeah. Um, you, let's see. Don't hide your hyperlinks is the is another one because the screen reader will catch them. So if you put if you put like uh, like your link here, and then the hyperlinks behind the here. Sometimes the screen reader I don't think screen readers always catch those. So if you put follow this link and then you actually put the hyperlink in. Uh huh. So the only thing right now, in the, I'm only teaching the last semester, and I'm still working on other class I'm teaching right now. But like the only thing I have up is like syllabus. Mm -hmm. So is there a reason why it's better to do it with Word than just a PDF? You could do a PDF too. Like um, which one is easier to access on the phone? I think if you so in this in this HTML editor, if you just copy your syllabus and paste it here then when your students look at it on their phone, no matter what kind of phone or iPad or whatever, it scales it appropriately. But if you if you just put the just the PDF file here, yeah, then they gotta zoom in and pinch and move and wiggle around weird. Um, so it's just easier for them to read it. Now, so, some of the screen readers are really good too, and they'll read the PDF file. Um, yeah. But if a student's looking at it, it, it could be a challenge to read. Yeah, in theory, <laughs> when they look at the <laughs> syllabus, <laughs> in theory, in theory, when they read it, right? <laughs> I put a, I put a syllabus quiz together this year for the first time ever. Just ask some really basic questions about the syllabus, like, is there a difference between this and this? And oh my gosh, why did you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't, you didn't read it, <laughs> you little turkey. So there, there is that. But between, and Office also has some really good, the, if you use the web browser version of Office, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the, um, the Word Online has a really good dictation uh, catcher. So, so there's that also. Yeah. So there you go. A lot of stuff. I felt like that was maybe too much stuff, Ashley. I don't know. <laughs>